<laughs> Hi, Charlie Kosorek, Jack Bench Woodworking, and I am on location today in Bloomington, Illinois with none other than Andy Berkey. Hey, Charlie, good to have you in the shop. How you doing, Andy? Good. Man, good. I am so glad to be here today. And I want to tell you guys why I'm so glad to be here, because Andy, not only being a cool guy and uh, somebody who I've come to admire on uh, social, social media, Andy has got a hell of a story. <laughs> you do, Andy. You have got one of the most interesting stories. I mean, you got a good story, so let's just get right the heck into it. Let's man. do it, Charlie. So, what do you want to know? Well, <laughs> I want to I want to talk about you know your background a little bit, how you grew up, and um, you know I know you spent time in the Caribbean and you're all over the country, and so why don't you tell me, okay, where where did it all begin? <laughs> Once upon a time. Once upon a time, the little yeah. Berkey man. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Probably the, the best way, place to start would be uh, growing up in my dad's house. My dad was a preacher in a small country churches. Okay. He, he would go to places that didn't have a church and, and make a church. Yeah. And he was a, um, a Finnish carpenter um, in his 20s. Uh huh. He got uh, drafted into the war in Korea. Uh -huh. saw some stuff over there that um, he came home and said, I'm going to be a preacher. Okay. So he, he dropped the carpentry thing, went to college, <clears throat> and um, became a preacher. Okay. Well, now fast forward a few years, and, and he's, um, building, he's building churches in these remote locations. Uh -huh. Out near Seattle is the one. He built one in California, but also in Se near Seattle. Uh-huh. And um, so we grew up working on those those construction projects, and um, we would do everything from you know pour the footings and and uh, the concrete floors to you know building the pulpit and all that stuff. Okay. So so his toolbox and that it was always a part of my life. I don't remember ever not making stuff, not working on cars, not. You know, we didn't have a lot of money, so um, we built, he got into Volkswagen Beetles. Okay. Because they were cheap to work on, cheap to buy, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, like for me, I um, bought and sold my first Volkswagen Beetle before I had my driver's license. Okay. <laughs> so, it was one of those things, I made a few hundred bucks on it, and, uh, right. you know, back in the day, that was that was high living. Yeah, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, so it was always just a part of me um, okay. and you know my my other brothers and sisters um you know d went their own way but for me i was i was five years behind everybody else how many brothers and sisters i have two brothers and one sister okay now they're all a few years older correct right okay. so i was that kid that kind of stayed behind and and um you know was by myself more than mm -hmm. than they were so um so, you know, I was building tree forts, and, and then I was also coming in and working with my mom in the kitchen, too. Mm -hmm. So my mom was a very good cook, kind of a, you know, farm. She was raised on a farm, and, and she was a farm type of cook. So, um, you know, we always had missionaries and stuff in the house. Okay, so, Andy, so you had um, all these different cultural influences in the house. Mm -hmm. And so you were, you were exposed to, you know... Um, world worldwide cultural influences, but all under the roof in Seattle. There, right? Okay, yeah. all right. So did did that? I'm just gonna guess that that maybe, it, you know, gave you more curiosity about gee, what 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 this stuff about? Big time. Yeah, because I remember, you know, people coming through. Because what they would do is is missionaries would come home for a year to raise money, uh -huh. and then they would tour around. Sure. The U.S. and sure, but they would come in, and um, I remember a guy from that was in uh, Papua New Guinea, uh -huh. and just the stories that he had. Uh -huh. I just remember, you know, oh. eyes as, eyes as big as plates, right? Just yeah. you know, because they were in. He, this guy was inventing a language to, you know, to eventually uh, preach to them. But here's a guy 
who was fit as a fiddle, you know, is everything I wanted to be as a, as a guy, yeah. you know. And he's inventing a language for these people, wow. a written language. It just, there was always that kind of thing that you were just going, man, it's a massive world out uh -huh. there. And this is, again, up in the mountains of Washington State where, you know, the nearest grocery store was 25 minutes away, 20 wow. minutes away. So it could have been a very sequestered, small environment. Right. But it wasn't. It was, it was huge, you know. Okay. I used to spend hours with maps, uh, atlases and... You know, back before the uh, right. the internet, of course. Oh but, yeah, right. But yeah, I would just sit there and, and dream of of places and and okay. what happened, how do people make their living there? You know. Right. Okay. So, so then uh, you um, grow up. You're out of high school, and what's next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a pretty angry kid in high school. Okay. Um, I was in a parochial school, yep. a Baptist school that um, was pretty hardcore. And, and basically, I spent my majority of my time there uh, either as in the back of art class or trying to figure out how to disrupt as much of the infrastructure as I could. Mm. So um, not uh, basically the way that they script it when you go to those type of schools. Uh -huh. <laughs> But I was uh, at that point ready, as angry enough, and and ready to spread my wings enough that all I wanted to do was get away. Okay. So um, I found a a school. Uh, I had to go to a, one year of of religious school. Uh, the, that was my dad's requirement. Uh huh. So I found one in in Germany. Had a campus in Germany and one in England. Okay. So that's what I applied to, and my dad said. He, he kind of knew that I had outfoxed him at his game. Uh -huh. And because um, all my brothers and sisters had gone three hours away to Portland, Oregon. Right. And um, that's what he had pictured. And that's what he, oh, yeah, that's yeah. what, you know, yeah. that's kind of the, it was all set mm -hmm. up. Of course, I'm thinking weird, right? So I take, take that opportunity. And, and he said, uh, you know, I'll pay for tuition, but you have to pay for everything else. Uh -huh. And I think that was kind of a block. And uh, so I took it again the, the other way and took it as a challenge uh -huh. and uh, found a job in a, in a factory. Um, we made, um, there, was, there used to be uh, playground sets that were cedar logs and pipes. Yeah. And they would make these massive acre, acres worth of playground equipment. And I cut the pipes okay. on a two and a half ton metal cutting bandsaw. So the, the morning after graduation at 6.30 in the morning, I reported to work and wow. and work my butt off there as many hours as I could grab for Man that on a summer. mission. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally not to be denied, which yep. was really weird cuz I don't know where that came from specifically, but mm -hmm. but yeah, I was just like um, not to be denied. Good. I mean, it was like Well, I I, I admire that. <laughs> I mean, your dad maybe didn't think too much of it, but I no, think it's cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Was, All right. So you went to Germany. I did. Yep, I didn't go to school too much, but I lived at the school. Uh -huh. And uh, again, I was um, going through a huge evolution in my appreciation of very, very good food in Bavaria. Yeah. A very, very good beer. Uh huh. And very nice girls. Uh huh. And, you know, all those things <laughs> that you kind of just like. Life was good. Life is pretty freaking good right now. Yeah. So, yeah, it. Um, it was really a cool deal. And at that school, there was a lot of kids from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So again, you're getting, you know, I had a roommate who was Lebanese, one that was Swiss, uh, Canadian, and I think somebody from South Africa, okay. you know. So you're all in one room together and culturally, you've got to make that work. There's things that, you know, we as North Americans do far differently from somebody from Lebanon uh -huh. does. And so, you know, you get that flexibility and, and that exposure mm -hmm. to that that I just think is massively healthy for anybody to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how long were you there? I was there, I was in Germany for about six months. Uh -huh. Then I uh, freeform travel for about two months. Freeform, does that mean hostels and a backpack? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, a, a year rail, a, yep. a rail pass. And we didn't, I had zero money 
pretty much. I, I think we figured it out that it was five bucks a day. Uh -huh. um, that was my budget. So we would frequently uh, take a train into a city in Europe and then do another train, you know, be there all day, hanging out, seeing things, and then take a train that went halfway somewhere overnight so that we could be on a warm train all night. Oh, we, okay. We would just round trip it. So you say we, who, who is your oh, who I, you're um, traveling with? I met a guy, um, mm -hmm. very strange the way it happened, but when I went, my, um, a guy who was on the other side of the family, was a brother-in-law, decided he wanted to do it too. So he oh. called me and said, I'd never met him before, right. but he said, can I you know, yeah. fly into Munich and meet you? And I was like, yeah. Yeah. And we got along. We'd never met each other, but we got along like hand in glove, and Good. and um, and um, was fantastic. Okay. And um, the downside of that was a couple of years after we got back, um, I lost him in a in a car wreck. Oh. So early on, it was a um, it was a reminder that we're guaranteed nothing, yeah. and to live every day as hard as possible. Okay. And uh, and that that has been reinforced at different points in my life by uh -huh. different things, but that was kind of my first exposure to it. Okay, so did you, did you have a set time when you came back on schedule or what, you know, coming back from Germany to here? Uh, well, I went to England for a few months okay. uh, to school. And then uh, after that, yeah, I pretty much, I traveled a bit more, but but I pretty much came back okay. after that. And yeah. you went back to Seattle or somewhere else? I came, I went back to, to near Seattle, okay. yeah. Um, but it was pretty interesting because I was completely alienated at that point from all of my high school mates. You know, I just... Um, just lost touch? Yeah. I mean, and, and I had... You say alienated, that, that sounds to me like there was a, an incident, but... No, I mean, it, what, you're right. Yeah, it, it's probably not the right word. But it wasn't that as much of an incident, but we had just grown so differently. You yeah, know, yeah. here I am, you know stealing oranges in Greece to have something to eat for vitamin C, uh -huh. you know, and these guys are, you know, going Got to jobs. college or in college, you know, and right. jobs. And it. so it's, you know, you kind of feel like you're not even in the same right. zone anymore. Yeah. 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 And that, that's the way it goes. Right. Yeah. Okay. But there's more. Yes. <laughs> there's yes. much more to the story. So <laughs> let's get into it. Okay. So from there you go somewhere else. What happens? Um, well, I bumped around, kind of lost uh -huh. uh, for a, a year or so. I worked at a Volkswagen dealership. Uh, I was the lot, what they called the lot lizard. Ah, you so wash cars. I wash cars. <laughs> I installed stereos. I, and then I eventually got into doing other things. You know, I, I was basically helping the sales guys. Uh -huh. um, I would do these really cool things called um, car swaps, where like if you needed a car that was purple and they didn't have one, Oh. They would put me in a car and, and send me to Idaho or somewhere uh -huh. and, um, and get it. Right. So we got to do these cool things. Sure. A lot of times they needed them in a hurry, so you got licensed to drive fast. and It was, mm. it was good fun, but there was no money in it. So, uh, so then I got the bright idea to, to get my real estate license and sell real estate. Uh -huh. I sold one mobile home lot. <laughs> For fifty dollars, they put they put fifty dollars down on it and never made another payment. So, so it was like a total train wreck. So I was just like, That's funny. I'm not supposed. I'm not geared to sell stuff. Apparently not. So um, and then I got very very fortunate. I got on with a crew uh, in construction mm -hmm. uh, of a brilliant crew in different ways. Uh, we were all single guys. Yeah. So we hung out together. We sailed. We hunted, we fished, we uh, skied together, water ski and yeah. snow ski, and we worked together. Wow! And it was a, it was a very magic um, time yeah. because uh, everybody was very, very cool, and I was the youngest of the lot, so uh, they they were very kind to me. Mm -hmm. um, but they were very hard at the same time because the the boss um, there was no. Um, squishy area for quality. Uh -huh. He said to me, the only thing that I want to hear complaints about is the cost. And that was the way it was, period. And that's a great headspace to start out. Well, he was a perfectionist. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, very small area. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, we worked for a lot of Dutch dairy farmers. Okay. So your reputation was everything in the world. And you mess, messed with one of those guys by doing, you know, not good work. Uh-huh. It'd get around like, you know, it'd be around before you got all the way home, uh -huh. everybody would know about it. Right. So there was only one way to do it. And, mm -hmm. um, and it was everything from, you know, uh, we made sidewalks for cows to walk on in, in cow pastures, you know, yeah. that would bridge, you know, swamps. We did that and we did, you know, cabinets and trim and, you know, we did the whole gamut, which uh -huh. I've been very, very thankful for uh, just to have that breadth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, was a, it was a very, very good time. Um, at the same time, I was trying to uh, play soccer well enough to attract the attention of a local uh, pro professional team. Okay. Uh, I blew my shoulder out a couple weeks before camp mm -hmm. that, that I was hoping to get an invite to. And uh, it kind of messed with my head. Okay. It didn't, mess, it didn't kind of, it did mess with my head. All right. And... Um, we were kind of all big into the Jimmy Buffett thing and, yeah. and all of that back in the day. Margaritaville. Yeah, yeah, Margaritaville. Well, I decided this was my opportunity. I needed to get away from everything and try to find Margaritaville. Ah. So I asked my boss if he would be okay if I took off for a few months. And he said, sure. You know, you come back and, and you'll have a, have, always have a job. Mm -hmm. Which, again, is at the time was like, ah, cool. But when you think about it, it's it's an amazing gift that he gave me. Absolutely, because it's, it's it's all about confidence when you're out on the road, right? Uh huh. That, you know, no matter how wrong it goes, you can always go back there. Yep, exactly. Make cow sidewalks. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you do them right. <laughs> yeah, perfect sidewalks. Exactly. So okay. I I literally took fifteen hundred bucks out of my savings account. Uh huh. Bought a one way ticket to Miami. Yeah. Had no idea where I was going. And I remember looking at the big, there, in Miami International Airport, there used to be a massive, like a city block long uh, flipper board. Yeah. That would, they, when a plane would leave, it's, right. would, it, everything would flip. Sure. And I think they had like the price of the ticket on there too. Cause I remember okay. looking up at, at the board and saying St. Thomas Virgin Islands was $120 one way. Yeah. Like laid down so, <laughs> So let me get this straight. So you're in Seattle and you're, we'll just say upset. Yes. <laughs> okay. And you say, I'm going to get out of here. Right. Basically. So you get a plane ticket to Miami. Now, how did, any idea how you picked Miami? Uh, I knew I was heading tro what we call Tropo. Okay. You, or you knew you wanted to get into the... Yeah. Okay. It, right. it was uh, January in Seattle. Ah. And anybody that's in, in Seattle in January knows it's just gray, wet, and cold. Uh -huh. We had typically had two sets of rain gear. Yeah. So one could dry on, <laughs> you wear it on Monday, it would dry Tuesday and you'd wear it on Wednesday. And uh -huh. then Tuesdays. All right. So anyway, so, so you went to Miami thinking you wanted to get off in the tropes somehow, mm -hmm. someplace, not sure exactly specific. Look at the board and say, I can afford that. Yep. And off you went. Yep. Any, <laughs> you, got, you got bags of stuff with you? One bag. One bag. One bag, uh, a sea bag. Yeah. And, uh, and you, yeah. Don't, you don't know anybody there, nothing? Nope. Not a, not a soul. Now that, to me, just blows my mind. <laughs> that just blows my mind. You got guts, Andy. You got guts. <laughs> You're one fearless man. I, I was... You're well, I don't know whether it's guts or lack of brains, but regardless, let's just leave it gray area. <laughs> regardless, I would never, I don't think I could ever have done that. So hats off to you. <laughs> so, all right. So you, you end up in St. Thomas, you get off the plane and it's warmer mm -hmm. and you got your backpack. You don't know anybody. And <laughs> you, you start shucking and jiving. I mean, you start you know that you have a finite amount of money, right? Right. So that equates directly into time. Right. So what's the first order of business? Get money. You get gotta, a job. You gotta, right. You got to get a place to stay. Yeah. And then you got to get money. Right. Right. And then you got to spend as little money as possible until yeah. things develop. So I happened to, to jump into this like bed and breakfasty type of, they call it a guest house down yeah. there. This couple owned for years and years 
and they had a little happy hour and they kind of started talking to me and say, okay, you know, what are you doing here? You know, and things. I, I just laid it out to them. They said, well, one of the guys that we know runs, you know, this uh, maintenance division of an air, airplane uh, yeah. company. He always needs help stripping the paint off airplanes. All right. Yeah. So I sure. rolled down there the next day and he's like, yeah, they called me and yeah, here, you know, here's the chemical paint stripper, which I'm sure was that nasty methyl chloride or whatever it is. Hands down. You know, I'm not Hands sure down. we had gloves. It right. was tropical sun yeah. and DC3s and you're on the wing scraping, yeah. you know, chemically scraping paint off. of. So I did that for any paid in cash at the end of every day. Well, good thing. Because <laughs> nobody lasted for more than a few days. Um, and I did that, and I think they were kind of keeping an eye on me. Mm -hmm. And like the third or fourth day, there was a guy at the happy hour sitting there, kind of quiet guy. And they said, ah, this is Ken. He's building his own house. Mm -hmm. And he said, so they say you can, you know, you've got some carpentry background. I said, yeah, man, you know. He said, well, if you want to work, I'll, I'll pay you. And he, so I ended up working for him on his own house. He had retired down there. Uh-huh. And uh, we worked on his house, I don't know, for four or five months. Oh. And, uh, and it was just this really cool headspace that he'd pick me up every morning. And I got an apartment, a, a basement, dirt floor apartment. It was full on, you know, everybody thinks they want to be Jimmy Buffett. Yeah. But the downside of the Jimmy Buffett thing is it's pretty dirty living yeah <laughs> but it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, cheap rum and dirt floor apartments and things but, like that but but you were what 20 yeah i was in i was probably 22 23 okay. somewhere in there at 22 Love. years old you're living high loved every That's minute great. of it yeah yep. today you probably wouldn't tolerate it. Yeah, exactly. But back then, that was okay. No, that's exactly right. Because it was, you were, you were, you, mm -hmm. the first thing you realize is there is no Margaritaville. Uh -huh. You got to work. Yeah. And thankfully, one thing my dad did teach me is a, is a work ethic, you know, that you, you, you go to work and you bust your tail. Right. And you do it with pride. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm always thankful for that. Because more than anything, that translates well when you're out and about. Mm-hmm. And because people pick up on it, you know, straight away. Yeah. More than skill, I think, even. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, yeah, we, and I literally did that until um, I was kind of getting the itch to move on. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I responded to an ad. They had like these sailors newspapers. Yeah. And uh, this guy needed a crew to take a boat to uh, Manhattan and then eventually through the canals to Chicago. Okay. What the heck? I'm in. Yeah. So that's called the blue water delivery. And so you're in a 42 foot sailboat in the deep ocean, which is a pretty sketchy situation. Yeah. Um, it can be glorious. Uh, three days after we left port that time, um, we realized that a force nine, which is one st step below a hurricane was coming directly up Oh, up man. behind us and we were dead in the path then we heard that another boat that we had drank beers with on the on the dock um they had turtled gone all the way over and lost three three people oh, man. so we knew it was serious a, a bad one yeah and i'll never forget it the captain comes up and he says okay here's exactly what's happening and i just want you guys to know that you're all here by your own free will. I didn't force you to come here. I don't want to hear any bitching about it. The only way we survive this is if we steer every wave accurately for, you know, anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. Uh -huh. And I, and the rest of the crew was way more experienced than I was. And I just remember every one of them, you know, kind of set their jaw and we, it, what a life lesson of, oh. look, you're into it now. Um, stay with it and do the little things right. And we did. We had to steer. These were now 60-foot waves. Yeah. Now, not like breakers on the beach. These are ocean rollers, so uh -huh. they're long. But the trough is actually 60 feet right. below the, the crest. Yeah. 
and you had to steer every one of those or when you went over the crest it, it would break the mast and then you would anything could happen then yeah so it was one of those deals where you know i i'll i'll admit i still have flashbacks to that stuff sometimes because it was uh Let's put it this way. I don't watch those movies about sea uh, well, wrecks and stuff. I just can't help thinking of Gordon Lightfoot. Yeah. The Edmund Fitzgerald <laughs> and the captain said, fellas, it's been good to know you. <laughs> That's basically what it was, yeah. <laughs> Only don't whine. <laughs> and don't, I don't want to hear no bitching about it. Right. No, go live or die. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, you know, you have to do short shifts. I think it was... An hour on, two hours off in the heat of, of uh-huh. the storm. So, you know, you had to, and you're, you know, you're, you're sick, you're cold, you're, uh, you know, there's nothing that's cool. Uh-huh. Nothing about it is right. even remotely fun. But in spite of that, you have to steer each wave. Yeah. And, um, you know, it kind of goes back to what I say sometimes um, uh, in online stuff and making is, you know, those little things, if you do the little things right and mm-hmm. accurately, the big things kind of take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. If, if you have thought about dropping on your knees and, and praying to dear God in heaven or whoever you pray to that you survive that storm, you wouldn't have survived it. <laughs> no time for that. Right. you yeah. got to steer each wave. <clears throat> and that's to me is just I'll, I'm continuously thankful for that experience because I use that every day. Uh-huh. Wow. Okay, so you finally do make it to Chicago. You're still here, so you survived it. I didn't make Chicago. You didn't make it. No, nah, we had a little falling out in the in the upper lakes. <laughs> oh, <in> the, <laughs> I kind of bailed out quick. Okay, <laughs> you didn't want it. All right, enough of you guys. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I uh, I had to bail out of there in in uh, a little bit of a hurry. <laughs> okay. So I basically had 85 bucks in my wallet and called my cousin who lives around here in uh-huh. central central Illinois. And I said, hey, man, I've got Greyhound will get me there and not much else. Do you have any, do you have work? He's a carpenter too. Uh-huh. He said, let me make a phone call. Call you right back. Yeah. So, you know, phone booth days. Yes. So sure enough, the phone rings and he says, yep, you can be working. This was on a Saturday. He said, you can be working Monday. Okay. I said, all right, I'm in. So. Took off on a Greyhound and got there on a Sunday afternoon and was working Monday morning. So that uh, that's how you ended up in the Midwest? Right. That's it? You've yes. been here ever since? No. Oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but a funny thing happened while I was there that, right. s- that summer. I was going to stay for a few months and buy a motorcycle and head west again. Uh-huh. Didn't happen. Uh, a, my wife fitted me for my tuxedo. There was A cousin was getting married. Uh-huh. So were you... Now, this is first mention of wife. I'm, it doesn't sound like you were married prior to no, all this stuff. Nope, nope. And, and had no designs on it whatsoever. As a matter uh-huh. of fact, I was anti. Okay. And because um, I just, the way that I had been living so far, you know, was just, there was no way that uh, any sane woman would put up with that. Uh, probably true. So, <laughs> <laughs> and going at, at a breakneck speed, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it was maintainable. But um, I did... I did, was asked to be a, an usher in a wedding. Mm-hmm. And um, so I had to go get fitted for a tuxedo and, and my wife, Susanna, fitted me for the tuxedo. I asked her to go to the wedding with me, which she did. So and, she's working at the store then? Yes. Okay, all right, yes. now, now okay. Yeah, she's working at the store <clears throat> and I come in. And yep. um, however it happened, it happened and-, and uh, A good turn for you. Way good turn, but, <laughs> but again, very odd because I was scheduled to um, be in Haiti um, with, my dad had, had come down with symptoms that they thought w- was a brain tumor. And he was in Haiti? Well, he, he was, had a group of guys together from his church that were gonna go do like a mission type thing. Yeah. I kind of saw it as my last opportunity, maybe, if dad did have a brain tumor right. at that point, that maybe I should go hang out with him. We hadn't seen eye to eye for a long time, mm-hmm. but you know, that kind of thing changes your perspective. Yeah. So I was scheduled to do that. And uh, so we, we didn't, my wife and I didn't get to hang out for but a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I took off again. So I, uh, I uh, did a stint in Haiti 
um, that was interesting because, you know, I wasn't really into the church type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the guys that were in country there kind of utilized me in the way that they thought best. And it wasn't, you know, with the church type stuff, but in the actual construction. We were sure. building a, a like a community center for the people down there. Mm -hmm. And it's another one of those pivotal moments in my life where... Um, you know, you just, you see par poverty for the first time. You know, you smell. You didn't see it in the Caribbean? I call it, <clears throat> the developed Caribbean, I call it a second world country. Okay. This is a third world country. Okay. This is, you can always tell if somebody's really been to a third world country because they'll mention the smell. It's, there's, you know, rotting flesh, sewage. I mean, all sorts of fun stuff that, mm. that don't, it's just how it smells and it permeates everything that is there. Okay. And um, boy, you never forget, forget it, you know. Um, and the people of Haiti um, impact me on a daily basis. It's one of the reasons why I'm so thankful for everything I have. Um, they, I showed up early one day outside of everybody else. All the, the guys in the group, you know, usually took a bus. One morning I woke up and, and hitchhiked to the site, which was about a half hour hitchhike. I mm -hmm. just grabbed a, uh, they have these trucks that just have people on them and you just hang on to the side of the truck and sure. take off. This lady who had fed us, you know, normally eggs because the chickens were running around yeah. and things like that. I got there and she said, ah, oh, you're early, you know, or we were communicating in Patois and, or she was and I was kind of going, uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> but she said, oh, you know, I have a, uh, I have breakfast for you. And she brought out a, a box of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, oh, man, I haven't had these in m months. You know, all, all the traveling and stuff, I hadn't had a bowl of Corn Flakes. Right. So she got me some goat's milk and just, it was delicious. Absolutely delicious. Kellogg's Corn Flakes with that rooster on the box. Yes, yes. I hadn't seen it for a long time. So I had three bowls and she kept, you know, it was a big smile that, yeah. that I was enjoying myself. And the in-country guy shows up, you know, and he says, hey, how are you enjoying those cornflakes? I said, man, that's great. I haven't had them in a long time. And, you know, whatever her name was, was treating me so well. And he goes, good. Well, I don't want you to change the expression on your face, okay, at all. And I said, okay. And he said, just realize that Mrs. Whoever she was, has just given you the equivalent of a month's salary for her. Wow. Because she's thankful that you're here helping her. Wow. And you know what, dude? You feel, at the same time, you feel about this tall. Yes. But you also feel so grateful. Wow. That someone, can I, can I have a month's salary from you right now? I kind of need it. Uh, would, you, would you give it to me? No. Yeah. You know oh, what I mean? I mean, no. And, and Sorry, this is, Andy. <laughs> this is a lady that does that on the spur of a moment. A guy walks into her hovel thing yeah. at 6 a.m. in the morning, and she's like, heck yeah, I'll give you a month's salary. Wow. And it was like, it really, you know, that's, that's turns you on your head. Yeah, yeah. But, oh, I also took a shower in front of 250 people. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, I haven't, I haven't told this before. Yeah, these, You heard it here first, that's folks. That's right. Whether you wanted to or not. TMI, let's go, man. Uh, this is it. This is TMI all the way. Uh, I played a, a game of soccer with the kids. They, they were on me. I had, I, they had brought a ball, and I had juggled it a couple times and kicked it. And yeah. They couldn't believe that a, that a white guy could, could you know, actually oh, sure. play soccer. They hadn't right. seen one. So they were on me for a week or more to come play on Sunday. Uh -huh. I said, okay, cool, I'll do it. So we get out there and this field is about three inches of powder dry dust. Mm -hmm. And you're in the tropics, of course. <laughs> so you're sweating like buckets. Uh -huh. And we are head to toe in mud. Yeah. And I am half an hour away from my where I live. And I said, guys, is there a shower around? And they said, sure, sure, sure. Well, I didn't notice it, but a lot of the littler kids ran ahead of us. So we were walking down this path, and they said, yeah, it's right up here, this shower. Well, the shower was a public shower 
that was basically a, a wall of concrete with pipes coming out of it. That was it. Uh huh. Well, by the time I got there, the little kids had gone forward and said that this white guy was going to take a shower, which attracted everybody in the village. So, <laughs> they wanted the, to see, uh. <laughs> as 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 I remember it, there was about somewhere around 250 people there. Uh huh. And you know, what are you going to do? So I turned around and dropped trousers. Yeah. And a huge roar of laughter goes, <laughs> goes through the crowd. I mean, I remember looking over my shoulder and this big West Indian lady grabs her heart and throws her head back and she is dying. <laughs> she's thinking she's going to pass out. She is laughing so hard. And I, reali I realized what it was, was <clears throat> my butt was oh, white. bright white uh -oh. and I was almost as dark as a lot of the, uh -huh. the lighter people there. So the shock of yeah. this neon white <laughs> section of my, oh, God. So, so you don't have a lot of pride or uh, you're not easily embarrassed after that. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh yeah. So you had quite, quite the adventure. Yes. Okay. Yes. Then Haiti, you've some, you came back somewhere in the States. I did. I did. Um, I worked for a little while with my old boss. Mm -hmm. Back in Seattle. Right. Yep. And then um, I got the opportunity to sail with uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, oh. which is, um, they do, I mean, you know, the government yeah. agency. Yeah. Uh, research uh, vessel okay. out of, uh, strangely enough, out of the port of Miami again. So I went through all that rigmarole. My boss was very, again, very, very understanding. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he was a sailor um, in the Puget Sound. He did a lot of uh, racing, mm -hmm. things like that. So he was into the whole headspace of, of this thing. So I did, um, I did that. I, I left and, and um, sailed out of Miami uh, down to the Panama Canal and then spent months uh, traversing up and down the, uh, the equator in the South Pacific hmm. and uh, doing uh, deep sea robotics. Okay. Um, I, again, I was just a deckhand. So, you know, I yeah, was but still, but I was on board and, and now, tripping. Now I this loved is a it. lot closer to Margaritaville than that first trip. <laughs> yeah, except there was no margaritas and no vills. It, well, it was all not. boat all the time. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was it was um, calmer on one hand that it was a 273 foot boat, so yep. it was a bigger boat. Um, it wasn't. It was a it was a month long storm. That that band along the equator collects all the storms from the northern and southern hemispheres and puts them all there. It's kind of like a depository. Oh. So okay. so you're basically sailing in that for a long time. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, you know, palm trees in Tahiti, South Pacific. Mm. It was, it was basically st stormy, storms. stormy. Yeah. So. All right. So, but okay. good fun. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We, we had a lot of fun in port, put it that way. All right. I bet you did. <laughs> so, okay. A couple of months out sailing for the government. Right. All right. Now Andy's doing internet stuff. So what's in between there? How'd you get? How'd you get from there to here? Uh, uh, after my wife, I ended up recontacting my wife, and, mm -hmm. and we ended up getting together and, and getting married. And um, we decided straight away that we wanted to put some room between us and both our families. Okay. Not anything against them necessarily. We just wanted to make our own yep. unit. So I said, well, you know, I have contacts in the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go down there for six months? Mm. And she's okay. She's open to that. So I knew I, you know, yeah. I knew I'd scored. She, yeah. She's right. good to go with that. But uh, we ended up staying down there for that time um, for five years and um, just enjoyed the headspace. And we enjoyed the fact that, you know, we didn't have any outside influences on us as far as the way people thought our relationship should be or anything oh. like that. It was just us hanging out. And, and we, we, we were just talking the other day, you know, 20 years later, we still credit that a lot, a lot of that to uh, the strength of our 
our relationship now. Okay. You know that we just got along. We so had you're down to. There, you're doing carpentry work there too. Yeah, I'm uh, now. I'm I've <clears throat> gone up the the grade. You know the pecking order, I guess. And and I was working for a company that built um, homes for people who were building their second or third vacation home. Okay. Um, rich guys. Rich guys. Yeah. And rich guys that know what they want. Yep. And. So it was pretty cool because that was my first taste of project management. Mm -hmm. um, while I was actually doing carpentry and finished carpentry, cabinetry and all that stuff, um, I'm also having to deal with um, a multicultural, multilingual, multi-educational uh, um, crew mm -hmm. that, you know, and then I've got these clients from Boston that are that are pretty darn demanding. Uh -huh. So I've got to make all that come together and and put out a product that's that's good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a it was a crash course in in a lot of things. Uh -huh. uh, I, <laughs> you know, you did that for five years. Y yeah, basically, yeah. Oh. So it's not like a good gig, really. It was a good gig. Um, in the islands, you you do get this thing called uh, rock fever, okay. which is a sickness that um, you have to get off the island, and it doesn't make any sense. You know, I had a pretty good gig going there. My wife had a good gig, um, but it was time to go. Okay, and you don't. You, you, there's no cure for it except going. Huh. So, and you you just know when you got it. You know, you just got to go, and. Um, so we did. We, um, I, I met a guy down there who got me involved in a company in um, the Norfolk Naval Shipyard mm -hmm. where we were working on a, an historic building, um, which I didn't know it at the time, but was a great thing for my resume because it was, a number one, a church. Mm -hmm. It was a chapel. Uh, they called it the Chapel Under Four Flags, which was four different religions used this same building. But it was a historic site. So... Naval inspectors were involved, ocean inspectors were involved, um, uh, like historic um, federal sure. people that were, National Park Service people were involved. Mm -hmm. So it was a very demanding um, environment. And uh, so I worked there only for, I think, three months, but um, it was really enough to get that on my resume, which uh, I didn't know it, but was, was a huge deal. Mm -hmm because it set up really all of the work in the in the historic uh, community and then eventually in the doing work for the Catholic Church. All right, Andy, so you're now you're in Virginia. Yes. Here, 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 here. <laughs> Virginia. Yes. All right. Worked there for three months on this, you know, pretty cool project. Yep. For some reason it didn't work out. Right. We, okay. we kind of figured out that we weren't built for the South. Okay. And nothing against the South. It's just uh, our mentalities, especially coming out of the Caribbean, it just wasn't a good fit. Hmm. So, so um, my wife decided that she wanted to go back to finish her college degree. Okay. So she had gone to school here uh, in Bloomington mm -hmm. at Illinois State University. And... Um, wanted to go back and go into theater. And yeah. so she did that. Cool. So we ended up here. And I, we thought we were gonna be here for a few years. Mm -hmm. But um, by that long. time, I got, I got involved in several of the <clears throat> prominent church jobs and it just. You know, listening to your story from Seattle, Miami, Virgin Islands, is that right? Yep. Um, sailboating up the coast, and here and there and everywhere and Haiti and Virginia. <laughs> it just amazes me that you're still here. <laughs> I'm amazed that I have survived. Um, especially before I met Susanna, um, I was going just, a, I was pushing the envelope a bit. A bit? Too much, all a the bit. time. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> In other words, and, and this translates into the shop, if it was scary, I wanted to be in on it. Uh -huh. And a lot of times just for the rush of it. Yeah. Um, and I think it's kind of like those uh, extreme athletes now uh -huh. that, you know, they're, the rush is 90% right. of what they're Jumped doing. Jumped out of a plane without a shoot, that guy. That guy, yep. <laughs> yeah. That guy's cool, right? <laughs> that guy's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a fine line. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
All right, but anyway, so you actually are still here. You've been here for what, how long now then? Uh, been here in Bloomington Normal for 20 years now. 20 years, okay, well that's... Oh, I did forget uh, w one hurricane. <laughs> 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 one of the guys that I had uh, worked for called me uh, 10 days after we bought this house yeah. and said, I've sent you a ticket, um, a hurricane just hit St. Thomas and I want you to come down and, and uh, help me uh, deal with Lloyd's of London with the insurance. Oh. Okay, but I knew this guy. I'd done yeah. a lot of work for him on his house and, and I knew that you know, he'd treat me well. Yeah. So, so I did. I, I, in a matter of two days, I packed my bags and went down. And um, he, he's sneaky because he basically made it so that it was too attractive not to stay down and fix the house. Ah. But so he kind of, uh, yeah. what's it called, the bait and switch. Yeah. So, um, so I was down there for another 10, 10 months, I believe it was. Okay. Your um, wife was still here. And she, she stayed here, yeah. Oh. And so I was back down. Um, and that was crazy because that's kind of a Wild West scenario. And to try to pull off, um, you know, you're getting up in the morning and, and sc uh, scavenging for diesel to run the, uh -huh. the, the generators. And, right. you know, you've got to get food and beer and, you know, you got to try to... And it's crazy because there's no services whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's a very real threat of being, you know, robbed on the street. And um, so it was really cool because it was like trying to do construction and, and very, you know, higher end construction in the Wild West. Wow. <laughs> so it was, that is another great, um, great experience because, again, you know, we've talked about this uh, in, in uh, online community of, you know, working with what you have available to you, mm -hmm. both in materials and tooling. Yeah. This was a prime example of that. And, and it was a great um, scenario for me to, to operate in because you didn't have all the cool tools. You had rubbish tools and three quarters of them were bent sideways and, yeah. you know, screwed up. And, and that's what you had to work with. So you made it go and, and did try to do good work with it. Cool. So great experience. Okay, so I'm getting a pretty good feel. I got the flavor of the background. <laughs> Man alive, you've got a hell of a story. I, I, wow, good for you. <laughs> no, cool, cool. But you're not there at the moment. No. Now you're here, and you got into somehow you, were, I mean, you've had your own business. You've done a lot of church restorations, big, cool, fancy stuff. Um, but now you're doing a lot of social media. So right. what made you decide to get in social media? Um, tell me more about the social media stuff. I mean, Facebook and YouTube and whatever. Right. Um, well, I have to say what, what attracted me to it was um, the community uh -huh. um, and the, the maker community specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been that odd guy out, sometimes by choice mm -hmm. and other times just the way the social stuff falls out. I've never been popular with the <clears throat> art community because I'm not educated as an art guy. And I've never been really accepted by the construction community because I do weird stuff that's not the norm. Mm. That, that we don't have a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh -huh. So I kind of have lived in this gray area bet between those two things. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's a big, big gray area too. It's not yeah. a little niche. I mean, it's yeah, that's a big area you're talking. Right. Yeah. It really is. And um, but consequently, you know, you don't. You're always the odd man out. Mm -hmm. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I was. I don't even remember exactly how it happened, but but I was contacted by a guy to get into a group on on Facebook and basically said, you know, we'd like to have you in here. Yeah. And I don't remember whether he had seen some of the, my work in online or something, it must have been. And uh, I jumped in and I didn't know how I'd be received, mm -hmm. um, but I was received with, with open arms and I really feel like the community to me is, is a surrogate family for me. And, uh, and I just try to give back as much as I get and I get a lot, so I, I make make myself a promise to to encourage others and and to uh, 
to really, if I know anything that can be a help to anybody, mm -hmm. um, I try to be as uh, giving and forthcoming with that as I possibly can. And I almost see uh, people that want to learn uh, online via, especially YouTube, mm -hmm. almost see them as, you know, the next generation of woodworkers and, and makers mm -hmm. that if a guy my age can give them a, a leg up by, by giving them some of my experience, sure. I'm going to do that all day long. And, um, and it's just been a hyper positive experience for me. All right. So, all right. So you're active with very, you're fairly active with YouTube. It sounds, seems like you're getting more and more so yes. all the time. Right. Um, Facebook, I mean, you're a demon on Facebook. I mean, I, <laughs> wow. I don't know how you do it, but you, you, you're a master of Facebook from, from my perspective anyway. Um, and now you have, and you have a podcast. Yes. Okay. Now, podcast to me, that's like, I mean, you, you're, you're up in the high, high upper echelon of social media stuff with your own. How did that come about? Uh, some guys that I had met online, David Welder, uh -huh. uh, who works in Jimmy Dresta's shop. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm losing, I'm losing everybody. Andrew Aragon. Yeah. Uh, Rod Reyes. Yeah. Uh, Mike Laffey. Yeah. Um, we basically, Andrew, uh, called me and, and just said, I'm thinking about doing a podcast. Would you be in? And I said, at that point, to tell you the truth, I had never listened to a podcast episode uh -huh. ever. I didn't, I knew what they were, right? but I didn't, I'd right. never done it. I don't commute here. You know, I walk from my back door 20 feet to yes. the shop. So, right. you know, I don't have commute time. Um, and, you know, guys our age, we didn't grow up with podcasts. No. They just, you know. <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> but but he, he asked me, he said, if we were to have one, I've got, you know, these other guys on board. Do you have a suggestion? And I, the, instantly I said, David Welder, because good choice. it's a good choice. Really good choice. That guy, his mind is so difficult to stay up with. It's so active and so brilliant that I don't care if one soul listens to Faking It, the podcast, because I get to sit down with David Welder and the rest of the guys, of yep. course, um, once every two weeks uh -huh. and we get to hang out and we really, our, our goal was to have it be like we're doing today, mm -hmm. just hanging out in a shop talking. Yeah. And we want the listeners to have that experience of just, we're just hanging out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been so fun and uh, we've had a ton of fun with it and we've had some very impactful episodes. We, um, when my dad died in the spring, um, David, called me and said, would you mind talking about your dad passing and how you're dealing with it and all that stuff? And you know, you're kind of exposing yourself, Big but, time. but on the other hand, yeah, you know, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. And, um, and we did that and it was received very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, Rod Reyes has talked about um, his struggles or his acknowledgement of uh, ADHD and ADD mm -hmm. and that the cool thing about that, Charlie, was um, several guys have said that because of that episode, they have gone to their doctors, have gotten diagnosed, gotten on meds, and changed their life. No kidding. Wow. It makes my skin heard, crawl right now. I, I did listen to that episode. I did happen to catch that one. I don't catch the... I mean, I'd love to listen to all the podcasts. Right. It's hard. Well... The only time it's really good for me to listen to them is in the car. Right. Like this trip from, you know, Minneapolis down to here, I listen to podcasts all the way down. Right. But I don't listen to them in the shop, and I'm the same as you. I go from, you know, there to there. <laughs> yeah. So I don't listen to them at home. It just doesn't work. It doesn't right. fit. But, yeah, I did catch that one, and so, wow, that's cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, I think two or three guys in their, I think, late 30s, early 40s mm -hmm. said, that is what Rod is describing is exactly my world. Uh huh. They went. I think they reached out to Rod, and Rod encouraged him to go talk to a doc. Uh huh. And they got on some meds and kind of calmed their minds down and changed their world. Wow. And it's I don't know, man. When you can impact people's world, 
that's that's huge. That is. And the social medias and everything as a platform, mm -hmm. it, it, it's cool because um, it's so raw mm -hmm. and it's just, I don't know, it's unedited and, and, and I mean, it is edited, I well, guess. It, but it, some of it is, some of it yeah, isn't. But it can be very just guys laying their soul out there. Yeah. And man, it's, it's awesome. I, yeah. I really dig it. I, so, okay, I mean, but you spend a lot of time. And you got, like I said, of course, <clears throat> the podcast, which is a big deal. Um, Facebook, you're there mm -hmm. a lot. <clears throat> Instagram, you're there a lot. Mm -hmm. um, probably other places where I'm not, you're probably there a lot, too, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. all I know. <laughs> um, so, what's in it for Andy? I mean, is it just satisfaction? I mean, you're trying to help other people. I mean, wh what, you know, what's, what's motivating you to, to, energizing you, I should, probably a better word, to be there? Well, I would say um, there, is, there is an element of, I kind of consider this my opportunity to pass on my knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, 54 now. Yep. You know, yeah. I've got a long way to go. Maybe I don't. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it has something to do with a legacy, too. And mm -hmm. I don't remember somebody um, on one of the podcasts were talking about legacy. Mm -hmm. And especially without kids. My wife and I don't have any children. Mm -hmm. You know, part of you goes, yeah, you know, it'd be cool to pass on something. And um, the, especially YouTube, mm -hmm. those videos have... A long lifespan, oh, yeah. maybe maybe indefinite. Maybe, you know, maybe not. Maybe they <clears throat> yeah, hold up tomorrow, but they're right. Most likely, they're going to be there for a long time. So I figure, you know what? Put it out there and, mm -hmm. and let her fly. Okay. And I won't. I won't uh, try to deny that I would love to make this part of the income stream mm -hmm. uh, for Berkey and Associates. Right. Um, I mean, that's the associate at this point. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> I, I fully enjoy working by myself uh -huh. um, without employees right. and all the stuff that comes along with those. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, having people available on social media, um, it's kind of like somebody's in the shop with me, yeah. uh, which is pretty fun. Because mm -hmm. if I'm working on something cool, I'm going to take a picture of it and flip it up on Instagram or, or Facebook or something. Right. And I do try to keep a little bit of a schedule of try to keep in contact with each, each mm -hmm. one of the things and keep the profile. Do you have you a know, Patreon? I don't. I'm okay. actually struggling with that. I, uh -huh. I don't know whether part of me really has a uh, like a pride problem with it. Yeah. And I, part of me says I just need to get over that. And I don't know. I'm on the bubble on that. Yeah. So, yeah. but uh, it's um, one of those ones where I probably will end up there at some point. But mm -hmm. I've got to get used to the idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm not there yet either. But so I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right, so it's been a hell of a ride for you. Yes. It's been a hell of a ride. <laughs> so, where's the good shit Berkey going from here? <laughs> um, well, I, I think um, the, the world is opening up as far as opportunities to work. And uh, with my um, involvement online, I've had multiple opportunities to bid jobs and look at jobs at remoter locations. Oh. And um, so uh, Susan and I both love to travel. Mm -hmm. So I, in an ultimate world, I'd love to, uh, to have the situation be right, that we could go visit, you know, uh -huh. uh, makers in Japan and France and, sure. you know, all yeah. over the world. And, so, you know, it's pervasive. Like I say, this is not a new thing for me. It's not something I I've just discovered. This, this thing is part of my personality. I've got to make, I've got to be around people who make stuff. Right. So, I don't know much about my future, but I do know it will involve making and makers and the maker community without a doubt. And possibly even welding someday. And, right. yes. <laughs> Yes, we were talking about this earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Welding is like my, it's, I, when I played around with, uh, you know, canvas painting. Yeah. I put a, can, a blank canvas on the easel, or mm -hmm. what do you call it? The easel, right? Yeah. Um, and it stared at me for like two months. And it was the most intimidating thing ever for me. It's this freaking blank canvas 
<laughs> well, you know, that's something that I, I, I wanted to ask you about, and it just occurred to me now. I had it in my notes, but well, I'm not a good reader. <laughs> <laughs> You've got this wide variety of skills. So just, just for the benefit of you know, this interview video, fill in the blanks of what I'm missing here. I mean, you've got, honest to God, artistic skills. You did this, you had that um, uh, picture you posted online of, a, was it a leopard? Yes. Really good. <gasps> really freaking good. Um, I mean, that, that is, that's a skill. You've got that skill. Um, I, I've heard something about, you know, you didn't play with pottery at one time. Right. Um, let me see. Of course, you've got the, the woodworking, you, the casting, um, and now, you know, video uh, expression, I guess you could call that. There's <laughs> an expression of video here right. in the podcast. Um, that's a, those are skills. Um, what am I missing? I know there's more. There's other things that you've dabbled in along the way, yeah. the castings and what else? Carving right. and... Yeah, carving's a, a thing that I've really enjoyed. Um, I've done some um, uh, vacuum form uh, lamination work, uh -huh. which I really enjoy. Um, Photography is a big part of my world. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered that probably five or six years ago mm -hmm. and enjoy, enjoy that. I, I, I tend to take... The Blaine Berkey thing should probably come up in our interview. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I mean, that, you're wearing the Blaine Berkey shirt. Um, just, before, before we get to the Blaine Berkey thing, other skills, though, that uh, we should be filling in the blank here, the carving, casting, <sighs> vacuum forming, pottery, photography, um, music? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm tone deaf. So okay, I, I, you can't, missed, I can't make music. You missed that boat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot make music because I can't hear it when I play it. However, I am highly involved in, in the local music scene. Um, I have a very good friend who has a small radio station. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just recently gone online, backlandradio.com. I got to give him a shout out because okay. he's a magic guy. All right. Backlandradio.com. Okay. Um, but very involved with small, what I call van music. The, the bands that they're traveling around the, the country and Canada in a van. Got it. And they're just playing their hearts out. I so identify with that. They get up there on a Tuesday night in mm -hmm. Bloomington, Illinois, and just give it hell. Yeah. And you know, that's just magic. That whenever I get feeling like in a creative slump, I we have a great 1930s Art Deco theater that, mm -hmm. that has it's a small music venue. Yeah. You know, maybe 500 people. Mm -hmm. I go down there, listen to music, watch what those guys are doing. They're making like we make. Uh huh. And it's, I don't understand it, but I, I can vibe off it. I can get it. Got it. And almost every time after a good solid concert, I'll come back in here and I'm ready to rock again. Okay. So anyway, wide variety of skills, even wider variety of interests. Yes. Cooking. Did we forget cooking? I love we to cook. Didn't come up, but now it is. <laughs> Add cooking onto the list. Yeah, I cook like mad. Okay. So. Now, one thing we have to talk about before we wrap this up, Blaine Berkey. Ah, yes. How in the world did we get Blaine Berkey? Not that we shouldn't be blaming Berkey, but how did we get there? <laughs> um, I, uh, part of my photography, part of my world is dawn and pre-dawn. That two hours, especially on the weekends, that, mm -hmm. that two hour stretch of time, uh, an hour before daybreak and, and the hour after, is uh, my dog and I are usually out in the country somewhere and um, and that's a magic time of life to me, and and it's a it's a almost a meditative state for me. And I frequently will post pictures of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, David Lockard, uh, a guy that I know online, mm -hmm. <clears throat> came up with the with the hashtag Blame Berkey. Okay. And basically, it is take a minute and look and see what's above you and okay. around you. And because we live in a magical world. I mean, we're, we're yeah. so blessed to, number one, be alive yep. and have our senses about us, our, our smell and our, our, right. our eyes. And it's just magic. 
but it's so easy to, to get jaded and, so and lose track of it. So that's the real meaning of blame Berkey. That's, that's exactly the real what the meaning, meaning of it. Right. And we can blame David for that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And he made these shirts, actually. So, yeah. Cool. That's, it's, it's just that moment that you would normally rush to your car when you come out of your front door and just see the sky on fire. Yeah. And just take a minute to even just appreciate it. But I also dig it when, when guys will take the, the opportunity to take a picture. Mm-hmm. We all have high resolution cameras in now our pocket. Now we do. Now. now we do. Take a picture of it and, and encourage somebody else with it. Cool. It's magic. That is, that is you heard it here. <laughs> Maybe not first, but you heard it here for sure. <laughs> Definitely didn't hear it first. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy, what else? What did we forget? Um, gratitude. Okay. My involvement here is predicated on an intense and jealously guarded gratitude of the, this community has been so, so good to me. Mm-hmm. And I just when you say this community, you mean the whole maker community the, in general. The maker community in general. Yeah. 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 Everybody from, you know, people listening to the podcast and and commenting in mm-hmm. to Jimmy Dresta, yeah. who takes the time as busy as that guy is, right. and as many demands as he has on his time. If you meet him in person, he'll take every bit of time to to talk to you and communicate with you. That's cool. And that, to me, is a number one, an example. Mm-hmm. But number two, just I just want to be entirely grateful to uh, that weird little kid that never fit in anywhere, fits somewhere. And I'm okay with that, big time. Cool. And I'm just, like, way grateful. All right. Well, I'm grateful to be here. Honest to God, I really am. Um, I've had interactions with Andy. Andy is one of the first people to, to reach out with me when I started getting going with my YouTube stuff in earnest. I've been on YouTube for a long time, but in earnest, and Andy reached out to me, geez, January, February, when I was out driving around West. Right. And um, I appreciate it and gotten to know you online. Cool. And it's been great. This has been wonderful. Been hanging out. Thanks so much, man. A pleasure. Appreciate it. <laughs> Hope you guys like this. Check out Check out what? BlameBerkey.com right now. We Check might, out BlameBerkey.com. We may be going elsewhere, but I'll let you know. Yeah. And Jack Bench while you're at it. Jack Bench. That thing is awesome. Thanks a million. Hope you like this. Bye. Woohoo. Okay. I've got about a year of editing <laughs> and a sore butt. That, that won't come out for three years. Actually, I'm catching up. And he was off his cake more than I was. Uh, wow. Now what, Charlie? <laughs> What else you want to know? <laughs> oh, man. I was put into a, to a parochial school. But did they put you in a parochial school to try and get a handle on you? I don't know. <laughs> did they put all, every, all, of the, all five of you through it? No. Where are we with our... Uh... Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you've got to chop about 90% of this. Oh, I'm going to have to. We're not even up to the <laughs> number two on the list, man.